Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve rotating the box. Interesting little problem here today. Let's just focus on the picture. We're given an M by N matrix. I usually refer to these as like the number of rows and the number of columns, but it's gonna get interesting with the variable names because what we actually wanna do with this matrix is convert it into one that has been rotated by 90 degrees. Now, it's very important that you know which direction it's rotated in. If it's going this way or it's going that way, it is different. So in this example, it is going clockwise. And the idea is that the things that were actually given in this grid is three different things. An empty position, which is represented by a dot, an obstacle, which is represented by a star, and a stone uh, represented by a pound sign. Now, after you take this and rotate it at 90 degrees, you'll notice that some of the stones actually move. And since those stones move, they might occupy different empty spots. But the stationary objects, these little gray things, they do not change at all. So you can see that they were here, here, and here. And after rotating, it's in the same position. It's just been rotated. So if this was in the second to last column, it'll now be in the second to last row. It was the first row, though. So now it's going to be in the last column. The reason that these stones can fall is basically just gravity. So like imagine if you were to uh, just isolate this row by itself. If gravity instead of pulling down is pulling to the right, imagine this stone is going to be pushed as far right as it can. And that's uh, here. And then this spot is going to become empty. So as I focus on this, I might as well get rid of what we have on the left and kind of clean this up a little bit. Like I mentioned, since this stone is going to be shifted here, this is going to be empty then. So then we'll basically go through this row in reverse order to kind of shift these guys to the right. So that got shifted there. We can keep track of the next open position by having a pointer. Let's say it's called I and it starts again at the right. And I'm going to have a separate pointer. I guess I'll call it like the column since that's kind of what we're doing like in this grid. So that column is the one that's going to be shifted. And this I pointer is going to tell us where the next available spot is. Now you might think, why should we initialize I over here? What if this is already occupied? Well, technically then we'll be swapping this with itself. And that's not really going to cause a problem. If again, you are familiar with like the partition step in uh, quicksort. It works pretty much exactly like this. At the top of my head, I think leak code 26 is pretty similar to that as well. If you want to like practice some of these kind of basics, the fact that we're doing this in reverse order does make it a tiny bit more tricky. And there's a couple other things that are going to make it tricky as well. But anyways, as we go through this, we uh, move this there. Our eye pointer will now be here telling us that this is the next spot we should put the next available stone in and our C pointer which actually reads the data as we kind of scan through this, is going to see this spot is actually now empty. There's not a stone there anymore. So I'm going to X that out and then just put like a circle here. There's the stone. So nothing there. So we can take our C pointer, shift it here. Nothing there. Shift C again. And now we see a stone. So we swap the stone with whatever we have over here. Now we will have two stones here. We will shift the I pointer over here. This is the next available spot. C will be shifted again to this. We'll move that stone there and then we'll move this stone over here. So this will then be the new row. Now that you have the new row, it's a little bit easier to transform it into a column. So that was doing it on one of these rows, but this was a special case because all we had in this row were stones and empty spots, but it might be a little bit different when we actually have these blocks. Let's see. Well, I guess uh, in this particular example, none of these are going to move because there's a block uh, here. So I'll make a slightly more interesting example. I'm just going to draw the row because really we're just rotating each individual row. So imagine that this is the row. These are stones. These are empty. And this is the obstacle. So again, we're going to scan through it right to left. The I pointer will be here. C pointer will be here. This is empty. Don't do anything. C pointer moves here. We see the stone, swap it with the eye pointer. Stone is going to be here now. Eye pointer will be here now. So next time we see a stone, this is where it should go. And then the C pointer will be here now. Now we see an obstacle. Now's the interesting part. 
Well, if there's an obstacle here, if I see a following stone anywhere here, it's never going to be able to go there. It's never going to be able to pass this line, this current stone. So I should just set I equal to C plus one. It should go in the next position. And you might wonder, well, what if the next position isn't empty? Well, for reasons we talked about earlier, it doesn't actually need to be empty. Because even if this wasn't empty, my I pointer will be here now. My C was here. It'll be shifted here. We see there's a stone. Okay, that stone should go in the position where I is. So basically, it'll be swapped with itself. Nothing happens. We will shift both of these pointers here. And again, nothing will happen. Now, if this spot was empty, then uh, I would have stayed here. C would have been shifted here. We would have found the stone. It goes in that spot. And then we'd be done. So that's the whole idea behind this problem. So when I code this up, I'm going to do it two different ways. One is going to be in place using the memory that we have. And I'm going to do this row by row just because it's a bit easier. And then the second solution, if we're not allowed to use in place memory, I will uh, do it without uh, modifying the input. And when I say in place, we still do have to declare a new array, like a new a data structure, a matrix because the dimensions of this are going to be inverted from the dimensions of this one. Now, lastly, if I had, suppose I did that, I took this matrix and I did the in-place conversion where uh, these two spots are now empty and these four spots are filled in. Now, how do I transform this into a rotated version of itself? Because if I can do that, I've pretty much solved the problem. It's all about the order that you traverse this in. Each column here is going to become a row in the next matrix, in the new matrix. So I should iterate over every column. And if I do so from top to bottom, I can fill these values in to a row. If I do it top to bottom, though, that row is going to look like this. I'm going to see the first stone. I'm going to put that in the first spot. Second stone, second spot. The third spot is empty, so that will just stay empty. So this is the row that I got converting this column into a row. But that's not exactly what we want. We actually want this to be reversed. So either you could just take this, reverse it, and then that'll be the new row. Or you could just iterate through each column from bottom to top. That's what I'm going to do. And this way, the overall time complexity will be n times m. Since we are modifying the input, we're not really using extra space. And usually the output itself doesn't count as extra space. So technically a constant space solution. But I'll show you a second one where we don't modify the input. So like I said, I like to get the dimensions of the input matrix first. So the number of rows is just going to be the length of this box. And the number of columns is going to be the length of one of the rows. Now we can iterate over every row in the input grid. So like this and this. And for the values in the row, we basically want to like shift them all the way to the right. So I'm going to have a pointer I, which I'm going to set to the number of columns minus one. That will be the last position in one of the rows. In that row, we want to read the character at that position at row column. And so if this is a stone, we'll handle it differently than if this is a obstacle. And if it's an empty position, we don't really need to do anything. So I'm actually not going to have an explicit case for that. There's nothing that needs to be done. So I'll have this and I'll have uh, this. So if it's an obstacle, remember what we said, this can be swapped with this. So the row is staying the same. We're in an individual row, but that column is going to be swapped. So I have this and I have I here now, and I'm going to set that to the opposite. So basically just performing a swap here. Nice thing about Python, we can just do this in line. And now, what do I want to do with my pointers? Well, C is already, uh, oh, I just realized we want to iterate through the row in reverse order. And right now, I'm actually not doing that. It's an easy fix in Python, just wrap this in a reversed call. Now we're good. And C is already being shifted to the left on every iteration of the loop, but I is not. I should be shifted to the left if we actually performed a swap. So here we will shift I to the left. In the else if case, we don't really need to do anything to the obstacle itself. We don't need to perform a swap. It never moves, but we do need to update the I pointer. We're not going to just decrement it by one. We're going to set it to the current column minus one because the next stone 
cannot go in this position or to the right of it. So I equals C minus one. Now we updated the box. We just have to rotate it. To do that, I'm gonna do what I mentioned earlier where I declare my result matrix. It will initially just be an empty array and I will fill it in row by row and then I will return it. Doing that, we have to iterate over the box, of course, but we're not gonna go row by row in the box. Remember, we're gonna go column by column in the box now that we've rotated it. So something like this and something like this. And so ultimately we wanna go through these values in the current column and populate them into an array, which I'll call column. It'll initially be empty. So column dot append the current value box row column. And then after we populate the entire column, we can add it to the result, result.append the column. Remember what I said earlier? Yes, a column in the box corresponds to a row in the result. That's why we're appending it. I'll make a comment to make that clear. But the order of that is going to be reversed. So either here you can say column.reverse or here just iterate through this in reversed order like that. So that's the code. Let's give this a run. And you can see it works. It's very efficient. But we can also do this without modifying the input. And it's going to be pretty similar. First, I'm going to uh, get rid of all this code and I'm actually going to move my result up here now and I'm going to build it up front. So I'm going to initialize it to pretty much be empty, but the dimensions of it aren't going to be exactly this. They're going to be inverted. So an individual row should have this many columns. So I'll initialize it with a dot and do this and for underscore in range columns. If you're new to Python and any of this like syntax is confusing to you, you might find some of my Python courses on NeatCode.io helpful. There's a bunch of like interactive lessons like this one. And specifically today, I think we were talking about a nested list comprehension. This is pretty much what we're doing in this problem. So if you wanted to check this out, feel free to do so. But mainly this is just an empty matrix with these dimensions, except they are reversed. So now we will still do pretty much all of this code, but instead of performing the swap inside of the box itself, we will move that item into the position that it belongs to in the result. Uh, actually, let me handle the else case first because it's easier. This I change is gonna stay the same because the I pointer still corresponds to like the same thing. But here, we want to take this obstacle and since we know the position of it's not gonna change, we want to copy it into the result. So here I'm gonna say result, the positions we'll talk about in a second are going to be set to a star. Now, this is the hard part. What are the positions going to be once we rotate it? Like, how do I translate these coordinates to this? It's probably easier if we look at an example. So I think I mentioned it at the beginning, but I'll do it again. If we have a position like this one, let's say this is the row, this is the column. It ends up over here where this is the row and this is the column. So what exactly happened? How do we like map this to that? Well, the first row becomes the last column. From here, we have row, column. It's gonna be inverted. It's gonna be like column to row, but there still is a bit of math we need to do on this as well. Now the column, like the first column corresponds to the first row. The third column here corresponds to the third row. So a column to row mapping actually works. Like a direct mapping from this to that does work. But from row here to column, it's kind of inverted. So from row to get the column, we take the total number of rows that we had minus R minus one. The minus one comes from the fact that we don't wanna be like out of bounds. And then this minus row comes from the fact that zero will be the last position. One will be the second to last position. Two will be the third to last position, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of just going backwards. So long story short, column can be the row. Row turns into this in the new matrix. So like I said, row turns into the column, column turns into number of rows minus R minus one. And so now that we've done that, we're pretty much almost done with the problem. We just need to change this part. For that, we're taking the current stone and putting it in the next available spot. So that is what the row is going to be. So a uh, result in I, and for this, we can just put the exact same thing as we had here. 
and then this will be set to the pound and then we will decrement i by one so pretty similar to the previous approach just a lot of like rotations you can see this one works as well in terms of big o runtime i think it's about equivalent this stuff is random don't pay attention to it if you found this helpful definitely check out nico.io for a lot more having a lot of fun adding some really great interactive courses lately and all neat code pro members will get access to all of them